Okay, so everybody, um, this is the question forum to live lecture for Sleep and Dreaming. I'm pulling up my chat real quick because I do see that we have one other person in here. So I just want to make sure that, that I have that up in case you have any questions. Okay, I do not have video on right now, but you should be able to see my screen and um, the questions that uh, individuals had for, students had for this term, or this week, I should say. Okay, so I have my chat up. It's two o'clock according to my laptop, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'm trying to position the laptop so that you guys don't hear a bunch of noise. Okay. Okay. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and start with the first question from this forum from this week, and this is from Emily. You guys should be able to see my notes on these questions, and I'll go ahead and have them available um, for you guys to uh, to look at. So if you're if you're wa if you are um, watching a recording um, and it's not available yet, it should be available. If you're watching this live, the notes that you see here will be available to you guys on Moodle along with this video. Okay, so Emily asked about the specific uh, locations in the brain that um, are related to wakefulness. So she says, okay, there are four different areas that stimulate wakefulness, locus cerellus, the raphe, additional brainstem areas, and lateral, lateral hypothalamus. If one of these four does not function properly, will it have a huge effect on wakefulness in the brain? Absolutely. Um, so just to start, before I get into super specifics, what I want to do is I want you guys to see this picture right here. This um, purple uh, graph looking thing, an old looking graph, this is from some of the original uh, studies on cat brains. Um, this is a very interesting series of studies looking at consciousness and wakefulness and how um, the brainstem um, how it's related to how people are awake versus how they're asleep. And so what these series of studies did is essentially they took cats and they cut their brain stems open or they sliced their brain stems. And so the point was, and so you can see here that the cat brain does look different from a human brain. Um, uh, you can see this sort of uh, where D is. That's sort of where the brain stem kind of goes off into the, the rest of the body. So this would be like the cat is facing to the right. Um, so here we can see A, B, C, and D are different, what we refer to as lesions. So a lesion is any sort of injury or uh, damage to the brain. Um, these would be examples of, of, of somebody taking a scalpel and actually slicing that area. Um, and what these studies were doing, we're looking at, well, what if we cut this part of the brainstem or this part of the brainstem or this part of the brainstem, what would happen in terms of, of, of um, would the, the cat be able to sleep? Would it, would it you know, go into a coma? Would it stay awake? Whatever. And at each of these incisions, we see something different. Um, so you can see where the locus cerulis is labeled in the cat brain. You can see the basal forebrain is up at the front of the brain. Um, and each one of these marks a different sort of effect that you see in cats when you um, lesion these areas. So you can see things like, um, you know, lesioning a particular part of the brain, a brainstem in a cat will actually lead them to experience REM sleep, but not experience the um, paralysis that goes along with REM sleep. So they actually act out their dreams. And if you Google videos of this, you can actually see this. And I, and I believe that I do have a video on, on Moodle that shows and talks about these series of studies in more detail. I um, mean, shows a, a video of a cat walking around. The cat is, is in clinical terms, asleep, um, but, but the cat's actually acting out the dream because um, they had part of their brainstem um, uh, lesioned. And so what this kind of showed us is that if you experience damage in the brainstem, you're going to experience different kinds of issues, like for example, um, a coma, 
which is essentially the person is not conscious um, or different stages of consciousness, um, usually not able to communicate. Um, so these different areas of the brainstem are extremely important in wakefulness and damage to any of these can result anywhere from death to coma in different stages of vegetative state. Um, you know, just saying that you're in a coma doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, it doesn't mean the same thing. It, it's, it's a spectrum. So there are individuals who are in, um, comas who actually we found are responsive if we put them in an MRI a scanner and look at their brain activity um, even though they don't seem to communicate and this kind of gives us a whole new argument in terms of what is consciousness even though a person can't communicate in the typical way of blinking their eyes um, or or you know using their using speech or something like that um, so you know, if you have damage to any of these areas, they can absolutely produce a huge effect on wakefulness. They can, they can um, result in states of consciousness that we would consider to be brain, almost brain dead or, or close to it or a vegetative, vegetative state to um, having difficulty staying awake um, and having difficulties falling asleep. So just looking at these, so, so that's kind of the, the broad spectrum of it, but looking at these um, different areas uh, um, individually, um, for example, the locus cerullus, you know, this is a particular area of the pons that uh, synthesizes norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is extremely important in your brain, and that can affect not just wakefulness, but other areas, for example, your panic response, stress response. Um, that's all very important um, to, you know, general living and also organ function. The raphe nuclei uh, is synthesized as serotonin, and as we've learned, serotonin is very important for wakefulness. Um, it's very important for um, you know different kinds of sleep. So you know that is going to it, you know we know that serotonin impacts mood and um, depression, for example, uh, is is um, a result of not enough serotonin. So when we look at these, you know, not just wakefulness, but obviously many other functions that can be affected by um, damage to these areas. Um, additional brain stems, you know, these projections go throughout the brain, um, obviously important for arousal and, and different kinds of damage to the brain stem can certainly result in um, issues with wakefulness, um, but also organ um, function. And so, you know, if you have if you have certain kind of brain damage, it's going to um, mean that you don't get communication to your organs, and that's going to re result in death. Um, your lateral hypothalamus is very important because it's the only area of the brain that has these orexinergic neurons, which are neurons that um, have um, and uh, um, that. Uh, use orexin. We know that, and we'll find out even later in this semester here, that orexin is very important um, for arousal because we've seen people with narcolepsy, which we'll get to this closer to the end of the semester when we talk about sleep disorders. Narcolepsy is a disorder where we see the orexinergic neurons being damaged. And so when you don't have enough orexin, um, which is also a neurotransmitter known as hypocritin, um, ha, ha, uh, hypocritin um, or hypocretin, um, when we see these orexinergic neurons being damaged, we see things like narcolepsy where people have issues with staying awake. So they actually jump right into REM sleep. Um, while they're awake and walking around. And so as you can imagine, it can be extremely dangerous because people tend to, you know, really hurt themselves when they fall. Um, so when you don't have a Rexin, then you are going to have issues staying awake. Um, so that's also very important. So we definitely see issues with wakefulness when you have damage to those particular areas of the brain. So if you have any questions, uh, additional questions, just let me know. Um, but I think that covered pretty much the broad spectrum as well as a few specifics there. Um, so you guys know that if I don't answer a question, um, you know, if you have additional questions or if I don't quite get your question, 
answered how you need it, you can always email me and I'll, and I'll follow up. Um, so Tyler asked about um, teens today and the fact that they don't get enough sleep because of technology. Um, it seems to be a common theme that teens are not, teens are not going to sleep because they're on social media, watching TV, playing games, etc. cetera. Um, so has anyone looked into it? Absolutely. It's an extremely popular area of research right now. Um, you know, using um, devices before bed is becoming a very popular area to study because we know that it impacts sleep. So we have two major issues going on here, and there have been a lot of studies, and in, in, there are current studies going on right now um, about these particular uh, themes. Um, so what we know from the research, there seems to be two major things going on. One, there's the devices that, that um, teens are using or adolescents are using. Um, these are devices like cell phones, tablets, laptops, televisions, etc. So we have this issue of bright light being emitted from these devices. And then we also have the the simple issue of distraction. Um, the teenager is just simply doing something other than sleeping. Um, there have been uh, several new studies and one specific study that came out um, that was a collaboration between um, many sleep scientists and it came out in, um, it's a Hershowitz study that I have um, on Moodle for you guys to, to look at. It's uh, set the new recommendations for how much sleep individuals should be getting based on their age. Um, and we know that uh, adolescents need a lot of sleep. We know that they um, today are not getting as much sleep as they need, period, end of story, regardless of, of what the reason is. They're just not getting enough sleep, um, which is which is really prompted to delaying school times, uh, school start times. There's been a lot of study that shows, um, a lot of studies that show that when given the opportunity, adolescents will go to sleep um, and sleep in. Um, their circadian rhythm is actually altered they they tend to go to bed late and like to sleep late and they need to get that extra sleep but when you delay start times for high schools we see that those adolescents do tend to get more sleep when given the opportunity and not only do they do better academically but behaviorally they're in better moods and they tend to to get in trouble less but when we look at these um, these adolescents, we know that they're not getting enough sleep and we know that there are a lot of reasons. So we have the distraction of just being on social media and what that does to, to adolescents and um, watching TV. Um, very likely the, the whole reason why they're, they're being distracted, they're allowing themselves to be distracted is because they're not tired. Um, they're not tired at night. And uh, you know, if you tell an adolescent, uh, let's say a 15 year old to go to bed at 9 p.m., that's not gonna work for them because we know that the circadian rhythm is delayed in adolescence. So they're simply using these distractions because they're not tired yet. So you know, an adolescent may start feeling tired around midnight and that means that they're gonna distract themselves until they feel tired and then they're gonna go to sleep you know, when they are when they're ready. So we have this sort of side of things. Um, and then we have the other side of things, which is, okay, well, they're not going to bed at a reasonable hour, um, regardless of, of the reason, but now they're using these devices. And we know that laptops and cell phones are um, notoriously bad for emitting bright light, um, and more specifically, blue light. So blue light, as you guys have learned from studying the neuroanatomy slides, blue light blocks the signal of, hey, it's time to go to sleep. Um, it tells your brain it's daylight. It's t it tells your brain to not be tired and it tells your brain, okay, you know, you need to be awake right now. Um, and so because of this, we know that the brain gets mi mixed signals. And so the, that people who are using these d devices at night, they're not getting the sleep. They're not getting the signal to, to be sleepy. And so this affects when they, the timing of when they go to sleep. So this exposure is a whole nother issue that needs to be addressed. When studies have um, been done to get adolescents to stop using these devices or to use bright light um, blockers, which are sunglasses that look like ski goggles, they have amber lenses. We know that this does help, that the, the adolescents feel sleepier earlier in the day and they get more sleep. They put the devices down or, you know, earlier in the night and go to, go to sleep. Well, we know that the blue light 
the blue blockers, those glasses, they block that light out. Um, and so we know that if they don't use the, the devices or they're not exposed to the bright light, that they do tend to feel sleepier earlier in the day and they will go to sleep. So we know that that has to, because these are experimental studies, we know that the that those devices are actually causing them to stay up later. Um, so yes, they, you know, we know that getting them off of these devices and getting them reduced um, bright light exposure will help them get more sleep because then they'll go to bed earlier. Um, their circadian rhythm is still delayed. We know this from, you know, from just from studies for, for many years, um, but we know that the devices are actually causing them to be even more delayed than what's typical of their age range. So has there been interest in this? Absolutely. Um, and we know that this is a, a major issue, which is why you see a lot of things like um, Android phones and iPhones coming out with things like the, um, the screen, you know, they'll change the screen based on time of day. Um, it'll try to emit less blue light by changing the screen amber. So you'll see these different settings on your phone. Um, there's also a um, a program called Flux that you can download on your laptop, your phones, doesn't matter what, what brand you have or, or what um, platform you have. It works the same way and it can, um, based on your location, can automatically dim your screen um, and reduce the bright light and blue light specifically um, to try to help you not get that you know, exposure. Uh, so, you know, there are definitely programs and companies that are aware of this and they're trying to help it, but that is a particular area that doesn't have a whole lot of study yet. Do those things actually work? Does Flux actually work to help? Um, does it give you, does it give a big enough change for you to see a change in being able to still use your 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 devices. We know that the blue blockers work really well, but we don't know if those programs and the settings on your phones are working yet. Um, there's some evidence to say that it's not working, but th there hasn't been a whole lot of study quite yet on that. So really good question, and we know that there's a lot of interest there right now. Um, okay, so Courtney had a question about serotonin. Now, this is a pretty loaded question because this th this is a this is a question that I could spend you know three hours answering, but I'm going to try to to be really brief in this. So she asked about serotonin um, and notes that it helps sleep occur during non-REM sleep, dampen by dampening the brain's um, response to sensory inputs. During REM sleep, norepinephrine and serotonin are responsible for quote turning off REM sleep. And then how does serotonin work for both of these roles? So. I'm going to give a much more general response only because, um, like I said, this is something that requires um, a more advanced uh, neuroanatomy um, explanation. Um, and so I want to kind of keep this basic because I know that not all students have had um, human neuropsych or biopsychology. So I'm going to, this is my general answer. How serotonin works in these particular rules is based off of a couple of different things. One is firing speed, and we refer to as like, for example, um, um, in, in this I, I say serotonergic, um, meaning that serotonergic neurons mean that there are neurons that um, have those serotonin um, channels, the serotonin um, uh, um, Oh my goodness, I'm, I'm losing my mind here. I'm um, sorry. Um, they have the um, ability to, to process serotonin. Okay. Um, and so when you, uh, so when I say serotonergic neurons, that's what, that's what I'm referring to. I also see, uh, say dopaminergic neurons. Um, so those are neurons that have receptors. Oh my goodness, there's the word receptors for dopamine. Um, so when I, when we, when I, um, the best way to explain this is that there's your brain is extremely complex in that it does a whole whole lot with a little okay so there are only you know relatively around 50 neurotransmitters that we know about um different chemicals in the brain and different pathways in the brain so it can do all of these complex things with just a, a little bit of material and when you think about it in the scope of things. So how does it work? It works by changing the rate at which the neurons fire. Um, some neurons fire 
in our excitatory neurons so that they're more likely to be excited. Some are inhibitory neurons, more likely to be inhibited. Um, some, there are neurons that have receptors for different neurotransmitters that are excitatory neurotransmitters and excited and inhibitory neurotransmitters. There are different pathways that work differently given different circumstances when they work in pairs with other areas of the brain. There's a lot that, that can, that there are a lot of combinations and each of those combinations are going to give us these results of REM sleep, non-REM sleep, wakefulness, different stages in your non-REM sleep, for example. Okay, so we have the firing speed of these particular neurons. So which clusters of neurons are gonna to fire together? Are they gonna burst fire? Are they gonna fire repeatedly, very quickly in a short period of time? Are they gonna are they gonna change the, the the pattern that they fire over time, which we refer to as temporal firing? So are they firing at the same average rate but just at different times? Um, are they in inhibitory pathways? Are they excitatory pathways, neurons, in, or their specific pathways? So each, so consider that when we consider how does something as simple as one neurotransmitter be involved with so many different processes, okay? So we think about the different combinations with other neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, serotonin and norepinephrine serotonin and acetylcholine and how they work together or they don't work together to uh you know to to go through particular pathways to different structures um so when we think about this specific i'm going to talk about this particular um 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 process in terms of REM sleep. So we have these serotonergic neurons um, specifically in the dorsal raphe nucleus that fire steadily during wakefulness right? And then they're going to decrease firing during slow wave sleep. And then they're going to cease activity in REM sleep. So when we consider the ser that these serotonergic neurons are reacting in this very specific dorsal raphe, dorsal raphe nucleus, there are also other pathways that are simultaneously getting different firings of exposure to serotonin. Okay, and then it's these combinations that will give us this behavioral effect of wakefulness, slow wave sleep, REM sleep, right? And then when we look at dopaminergic neurons, for example, we see that there isn't a change in the midbrain in terms of firing rates, right? But they do change in terms of timing, temporal meaning time. Okay. And this temporal pattern in the areas of the brain at the same time. So in the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens and the forebrain area, we see enhanced release in particular areas, right? But the temporal pattern, the timing of which they release doesn't change, but we do see more release Okay, so the timing doesn't change, but we do see enhanced release in these three specific areas for dopamine. Meanwhile, serotonin is doing a separate burst firing in different areas of the brain and then remaining quiet in other areas of the brain. So these different combinations are going to give us the specific behavioral response that we're going to see in terms of wakefulness or different stage of sleep. Okay, now, to add to this, I want you guys to know that there are different types of neurons that we see, for example, in the ventral lateral preoptic nucleus or the VLPO. The VLPO, we have identified actually different types of neurons. We have type one, which are inhibitory specific neurons that tend to be more likely to be inhibited by different neurotransmitters. And then we have type two, which are more likely to be excited by specific neurotransmitters. So not only do we have inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters, you know, the actual chemicals, but we have different types of neurons that are going to be more or less likely to respond to those specific neurotransmitters. Those are specific neurons with receptors for those neurotransmitters that are going to be more or likely to be more or less sensitive to those neurotransmitters. So 
this it sort of opens up even more combinations that we can have with different pathways and different combinations of behaviors given those neurotransmitters. So I know that we say, oh, well, serotonin is important for this. Dopamine is important for that. And you know, norepinephrine is important for this. And um, noradrenaline is important for that. We know that these neurotransmitters, we give them these very basic sort of labels, but it's the very intricate, very specific um, combinations of not only with, neuro, with other neurotransmitters, but also with how they're firing with very specific neurons that are going to result in, you know, these effects that we see right? Um, so it's a very important to know that, that, that when you change one thing, if you take SSRIs, for example, which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs are often prescribed for depression because we know that depression is involved with, you know, not enough serotonin in certain areas. So these reuptake inhibitors actually block the cells from sucking it back up and essentially not using it, okay? And so um, we, it blocks the serotonin from, from misuse or, or non-use, and it allows the cell to release more serotonin. And so when the cells release more serotonin, that's going to, um, it's going to change the amount of receptors on different cells, and it's going to allow the other cells to, uh, to, to get more of the serotonin in the synaptic cleft. So instead of it getting sucked back up and, and not going anywhere, it's going to release more, it's blocking that, that, that action, and it's gonna release more to the next neuron. And so when it releases more to the next neuron, it's going to alter the amount of, neuro, of receptors on that in that particular area. And so when we see more receptors, we see more serotonin um, release, we see more serotonin processing, then that's going to have a ripple effect with all the other neurotransmitters. You can't just single out one neurotransmitter and say, okay, we just want to affect serotonin. You're going to see a change in the other neurotransmitters because all of these work together so intimately and so intricately that if you affect the neurotransmitters in one specific area, you're going to see it have a ripple effect and not only affect other pathways. So we're going to see, for example, with SSRIs, more serotonin in many different pathways. We're also going to see it impact the other neurotransmitters that it dances with, right? Okay, so hopefully that answered your question. Like I said, that's a very specific question on how it works. There's still a lot of things we don't know, but um, hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of how complex this idea is. Okay, so for our last question today, I'm just checking my, my notes here, is from Michaela. Um, and we have um, this question about how light um, and, uh, affects our uh, biological clock. Okay, so she asks, um, some of the studies involving how light reflects our biological clocks might have been flawed and not as severe as people once thought. How would those studies apply to people that have severe blindness and cannot detect any light at all? Would their sleeping patterns even change? Absolutely. So regardless of the studies done in normal functioning humans with, um, you know, that, who are able to, to get in all of the light and don't have any sorts of blindness. Yes, there have been flaws about, about that. Um, but you know, we have a pretty good idea of how that works. We have a good idea of, of how light impacts behavior and how, um, light affects our circadian rhythm. So we have a really pretty, a really good understanding of that. Now, when it comes to individuals who are blind, okay, if you are 100% blind, like you, there's zero light. So there's when a lot of times when we say a person is blind, um, we don't always, you know, there's, there's a, it's a spectrum, right? So individuals who are, who are 100% blind, zero ability to detect even light. They have often very, very hard time with circadian rhythm. Their circadian rhythms are completely out of whack. That's because they're not getting that light signal. Now, we know that light is a zeitgeber and that is what the most powerful zeitgeber that's going to tell us what time of day it is. And so if you don't have 
uh, light input, then it's going to really mess, mess your circadian rhythm up. Now, there are other signals that can tell the body what time of day it is, but light being the most important, these individuals who are 100% blind do suffer from circadian rhythm disturbances. They're essentially on a free running rhythm and they need help to, to get their circadian rhythm um, on a 24 hour cycle. So if you are partially blind, um, if you uh, are, you know, uh, if you're able to detect light, it's very good chance that you're still going to have circadian rhythm disruption, but it's not going to be as severe as somebody who is, who is absolutely 100% blind. Um, when you look at, uh, if you, you know, usually when you talk to a blind, a blind individual, most, a very high percentage of people who are blind do have some sort of light input. Um, whereas, you know, this, this percentage of people who are 100% completely blind don't have light input. Um, there are going to be circadian rhythm disturbances for people who are blind. And so there have been some uh, recently, uh, you guys might have seen this, it's really interesting. There's a commercial out right now um, for this condition called non 24 hour sleep wake disorder. A lot of times you hear it referred to as non 24. There's a medication called Hetlios, and that is um, a medication that is. Um, it's, I believe it's the only FDA approved medication right now for non-24. And so what it is essentially is trying to get blind individuals, um, their circadian rhythm back on track. And so um, it's, it's specifically designed to get um, a, a person back on a a, a, off of a free running rhythm and back onto a 24 hour rhythm. Um, and so I, in all the sleep conferences I've been to, I'm, I'm starting to see this Hetlios. Um, uh, they, they, they actually have people come and they, and they, uh, talk to doctors, physicians, um, sleep specialists who see patients with, um, uh, who are blind and have non 24, um, non-24 uh, is a condition that, of course, can be caused by other things other than blindness. Um, damage, for example, brain damage, um, damage to the brain can actually cause that. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm specifically talking about individuals who are blind, but non-24 can be caused by other things. And a person who is not blind can have non-24, usually caused by some sort of brain damage by stroke or lesion or tumor or, you know, uh, um, accident or something like that. But um, so uh, these, these uh, uh, pharmaceutical reps that come to the sleep conferences and I've, and I've noticed that this has become more and more popular to talk about. Um, and they're, uh, um, it's becoming prescribed a lot more for, for non-24. Um, so I don't know how effective it is. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen the studies on it quite yet on how effective this particular medication is. I know it's gone through clinical trials and they've had a success with getting uh, people back on track in terms of their, their circadian rhythm. But yes, absolutely. People who have severe blindness, um, people who cannot detect any light at all, do have circadian rhythm disruption. It's very severe and it's, 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 um, it's a problem that many people have had for a very long time and have not had um, a good solution for it. So medications are you know, being tested today to try to get people back on track um, to um, get their life, you know, in more order because, um, not having a proper circadian rhythm is extremely disruptive, um, and can have a lot of issues with people, especially if they, um, are working, if they're, you know, caring for their family, just trying to have a good quality of life can be very disruptive. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. I don't see any questions on chat. Um, and so what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and end, um, this particular lecture, if uh, you have any additional questions or you need clarification on the answers, please feel free to email me um, and have a wonderful day.